well, <clears throat> can you hear me? Why did they ask me to come and speak behind this guy? <laughs> this is absolutely incredible, absolutely. But I'm happy to be here and to join you and uh, to share with you some of my experiences. And I um, <clears throat> first want to say that my wife has joined me here, uh, Kate Lafayette. Okay, she's uh, uh, part of history. She was one of those who were uh, from Tuskegee, Alabama, Macon County, and she was part of the first group of uh, college students there who uh, was uh, the test case for voter registration back in the early days there. And uh, so she's done some very incredible things. She knew George Washington Carver, okay, when she was a little girl growing up. And uh, he taught her mother how to uh, take care of the plants and that sort of thing. So she's a part of uh, very, you know, unique history uh, in our country there uh, from Tuskegee. But more importantly for me, that's why I know that uh, God loves me. Uh, I've been reassured because he gave me an angel to guide me through so I know what heaven was like before I got there. That's my wife, Kate Lafayette. And she lets me have ice cream every night. <laughs> well, I want to share with you uh, some of the uh, concepts and the philosophy related to nonviolence. And I just thought that what we've done so far here that I've experienced is so apropos to what I'm going to share with you this evening. Because you're right on it. There's no question about it. You're right on it. And I'm so proud to be associated with uh, Emory University when I see what you're doing as young people and students here. It makes me very proud. I can tell you that. Nonviolence is old as the history of mankind. And yet it's a foreign term to many people. My first exposure to this uh, concept did not bear the name nonviolence. It basically um, described what love was all about. And we've heard this many times in growing up, you know, how important it is to love. And there are many different loves, of course, and uh, the Greeks have five. Uh, we talk about um, love in the nonviolent context. We separate it, the eros, which is mainly the um, love for the uh, you know, spiritual realm of life, but then it's, it's come to be uh, the love between those who uh, have affectionate relationships, more intimate. And then, uh, of course, there's um, uh, philos, or philia, which has to do with relationship between brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters and more fraternal, that's the basis of our fraternities, the philos, philia. But nonviolence is based on uh, agape, the Greek uh, definition of love, which means that you, you love uh, expecting nothing in return. It's a love that's not reciprocal. It's not the basis of it, exchange, equal exchange. But it's a love that goes beyond the particular kind of uh, rewards that one would get.
from each other. You love me, I love you. You don't love me, then I don't love you. No. This agape has to do with something that's much more powerful. And in fact, it's, uh, it, it's regenerated based on uh, the ability to give. That you give only to gain, but you gain more to give. But it's not reciprocal in the sense that you gain from those that you give to, but rather within itself become self-generative. So the concept then of nonviolence is based on this type of love. And I came to experiment with this in the context of the movement for social change when I was in Nashville, Tennessee as a student. I got involved in the student sit-in movement and I started to learn about this concept of nonviolence from James Lawson, Jr., who was a Methodist uh, student, seminary student at Vanderbilt, worked for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And he started these trainings there in Nashville among us. And there were people like uh, our congressman here, uh, John Lewis, was involved in those workshops, and Diane Nash, who some of you uh, have been exposed to since uh, she's been involved in the Freedom Rides and that sort of thing, and uh, uh, many others, C uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who is an uh, icon in the movement as well. Um, there are a number of Freedom Riders who live here in Atlanta. Uh, we were involved in this uh, real important experiment. How do we change these segregated conditions and is it possible to change these conditions without using revolutionary methods, without using force and arms? Is there another power that's not destructive, but a power that's constructive, reconciliatory, transformative? And we became really fascinated by this idea. Mahatma Gandhi, we exposed to Mahatma Gandhi, this little man dressed in this little skimpy outfit, had the power to change England. My goodness. But first he had to change the people in India. But his experiment actually started in uh, South Africa. That's where he was, in South Africa, in Durban. And this little Indian fella, okay, Mahatma Gandhi, decided to experiment with this notion. And he started that experiment. We call it an African uh, roots with uh, you might say Indian and American fruit, but it's really global around the world. So here we find this concept of, of nonviolence, uh, uh, the one that's uh, the noun rather than the adjective, not the one with the hyphen. The one with the hyphen could be without violence, but uh, the concept of nonviolence as a noun, is a name of a philosophy, a name of a way of life, a name of a system of thought. And here we find uh, this uh, little Indian man was able to embrace this concept and be able to demonstrate it in such a way that people began to find new ways and new tools to struggle for social change. But it had to start from within. Yes, it had to start from within. The overcoming that we sing in the movement starts with overcoming our own inability to control our emotions. Yes. Because if we can control our own emotions, then it means that we can control situations. Most of the violence that occur 
we think of physical violence, but I would say if there was a survey done, the massive amount of violence, not physical, but it's how people treat each other. Unfortunately, there are some people who did have a family reunion one time, and then they decided that we can't have any more family reunions. Let's just uh, text each other, you know, uh, call each other on the phone or something like that. But they won't come together because of the relationships and perceptions that people have. <laughs> So this is an important kind of experiment because it not only does it deal with countries or either factions of groups within countries, yes, because of ethnic reasons and because of so-called racial. And I want to clarify this right now. The basic problem that we have in relationship to people, many times uh, we uh, call it racism. And we call it uh, racial conflict, racial oppression. Well, you see, actually, the, the racial part is just a symptom of a deeper problem. The racism is really based on what Dr. Chester Pierce a uh, former professor at Harvard University School of Education called childism. Childism is much more pervasive and universal than any other kind of ism. So that is the basis of all the other ageism, uh, sexism, okay, we call it racism, uh, all kind of other isms like that. It's like, for example, uh, you would not give a child a $20 bill, a four-year-old, even though you want to make a contribution, make them happy, and they take the $20 bill, what do they do with that bill, that, that money? They turn around and give it to their parents, because after all, they're children. And you would expect them to be responsible and to use it responsibly. So childism. Nigeria produced about one-fourth of the oil uh, in, uh, in, for the United States. But you wouldn't expect them to be able to have a refinery over there in Africa. No, we'd have to bring the oil here, we will ref and then we'll sell it back to them. Childism. It has nothing to do with race. No. Race becomes an, a convenient line of demarcation so we can decide who we are going to exploit. Yes, there are some women who are hired and people don't even know they're women. Thought they hired a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And by the way, there are some blacks who are hired and they think they're black, but we know them. We could look at them and tell, okay? Yeah. In Louisiana, one time they had about 2,000 uh, black people move north and became white. And I do with race is trying to identify color. And see, if you put race on the base of color, you mess up every time. Yeah, it happened in Nashville. We were uh, demonstrating at the movie theater and we had this situation where 20 of us would go uh, to a theater and we would stand outside because you couldn't go inside buy a ticket, you had to stand outside. And we would go round and round, okay? And then we would uh, uh, try to get a ticket. And uh, we were refused. This woman got out of the car, her husband went to park the car, he got up there and uh, she was trying to get a ticket and they wouldn't sell her a ticket. We knew she was white, but she had a deep suntan. And she could not buy a ticket. That had nothing to do with race. That had to do with the color line and trying to figure out, okay, who they're going to exploit. Moving on very quickly. 
I want to share with you an example of nonviolence. I was parking my car one night in Selma, Alabama. The same night that Medgar Evers was killed. Medgar Evers was the state president of the NAACP. And when these people came on to me who had a, a car parked across the street, the hood was up, so I assumed they had a car trouble. There were two white men, and they came in. One of them walked up to where I was, and I knew that that was it for me. So I turned around because we were trained to face our opponents, our potential assailants. And he said, uh, buddy, how much you charge me to give me a push? I was glad that's all he wanted. I said, no push, no problem. <laughs> I'll give you a push. I jumped in my car, had a 48 Chevrolet, and I drove up behind him to match the bumpers. And he stood down he, out there, and then he finally got on, down on his knees looking to see if the bumpers matched. And then he finally told me, he said, uh, you know, uh, you better come out and take a look. And when I got out there and bent down, because it was late at night, I was trying to hurry up and get this pushover so I can get back to bed. And, and he, boom! I went straight down to the ground. I got up. I knew it was a trick then. And I stood up and faced him. He was huge. Had a crew cut, hair cut, sleeves rolled up. And then he hit me again, right on the top of my head. I fell to the ground, rolled over in the streets, got back up again. I was only weighing 136 pounds. I looked at him again. I could hardly see him because the blood was all over my face. I could look through my eyelashes and I could see him. And then he hit me again, rolled over, got back up, struggle. <sighs> Looked at him. The theory is unusual but genuine behavior has the potential to arrest the conscience of your assailant. Unusual but genuine behavior. What was I thinking about? when I stood up and looked at him and maintained self-discipline. I was thinking about the fact that here he was. I don't know what his profession was, but probably he didn't have a lot of things in life, all right? So I thought about the fact, and you have to be preoccupied. You can't be black-minded when you practice nonviolence. You gotta be active-minded, you gotta fight. And what you're fighting, okay, on the inside. You see my point? Yeah, maintaining your own discipline. Fight in fear. Yeah, that's one thing you got to fight. When someone attacks you, you got to fight fear. Yeah. I was thinking about this. If I had grown up white in his community, had his parents, had his minister, had his relatives, had his, had his, had his, why I would have behaved probably the same way as he did. It's an accident. You, were, you didn't choose what race you were going to be born in, so-called race. You didn't choose what ethnicity or that. You didn't choose. You didn't make those choices. Here you showed up on earth. And by the way, we're not born in cities and countries. We're born on a planet. And we share it with the folks right now that we are with. But it won't be long. We're just here for a season. But what I was thinking about is I close, and it's now close time. A song that I heard in Nashville when I couldn't find a good station on, on, on the radio, I, I, I decided that I just I kept hearing those hillbilly songs. In Nashville now, 96 stations. And I said, well, I'm just going to turn that thing off. Then I thought about it. No, no, I need to. I was hearing the music, but I was not listening. That's the key to nonviolence, listening. So I turned the station on, and the first one I got, so I close. Here's what I heard, and here's what I think about all the time when I look at how sometimes some white folks behave towards blacks. And you know what I've discovered? <laughs> you ought to see how they behave <laughs> to each other. People accuse folks of behaving a certain way because they're black. Uh-uh, not all the time. You ought to see how they treat each other. And I heard this song. She was poor, but she was honest. Victim of a rich man's pride. When she met that Christian gentleman, Big Jim Folsom, and she had a child by him. 
It's the rich who gets the glory. It's the poor who gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Now ain't that a dirty crying shame? Now he sits in the legislature making laws for all mankind while she roams the streets of common Alabama selling grapes from her grapevine. It's the rich who gets the glory. It's the poor who gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Now ain't that a dirty crying shame. Thank you.